Welcome to the Kennedy Report. I'm Kennedy Hall. It's sweater weather, as they say. The weather has changed. I'm going to jump on here quick today to talk about the recent controversy. At this point, it's about about three weeks old, four weeks old, but a new wrinkle has been unveiled, let's say, uh, through a little bit of research I've been doing. So if you haven't heard of it, basically, uh, four bishops, it was Strickland, Schneider, Reseda, another fella, Mustarts, I think you pronounce it. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it properly. Um, various theologians and priests like Father Gerald Murray, which I found very surprising and very edifying to see him on there, to be honest, um, as well as men like Dr. Anthony es Esselin and so forth. They signed on saying that Pope Francis's document, Desiderio Desideravi, had basically contained heresy in that. And we're going to get to that in a second. And we're actually going to get to how that heresy is actually in canon law, at least implied. And this is one of the reasons that Mar Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre actually went through with the consecrations, because he found this in the Code of Canon Law and realized that what is happening would happen and it would lead souls into error. But first, I've got to say thank you to our sponsor, um, Pray Latin, praylatin.com. You can see here on the screen, uh, praylatin.com. If you ever wanted to pray in Latin and didn't know how, it's actually not that difficult. And what you can do is you can find cards on their website where they actually have Latin and English side by side. For example, this one, I'll make this a little bit bigger for you so you can see it properly. This is the Memorare, and you can see it there where it's on Latin on one side, on the other side, it's English. There is Latin pronunciation. So you can actually open up the card and you can see here, for example, um, make that even bigger. There you go, right in the middle. You can see, for example, in Latin, it says Virgo Maria. That's easy enough, but if you have problems with Latin language pronunciation, it's got it written in English, V-E-E-R-G-O, so Virgo, that would be how we pronounce things like that in Latin, Maria. It's wonderful. Um, you know, here's a more difficult word, for example, Derilictum. If you don't speak lang languages where you pronounce things like that, that might be difficult. So de, you can see it's Derilictum. Perfect. Anyway, I think this, I, I was actually a French teacher I was a French teacher and a Spanish teacher and an Italian teacher. Um, I don't have a degree or anything in Latin, but speaking in those languages fluently, I can understand these things pretty well. Um, so it's easy for me to learn languages. Now, I shouldn't say that. It was difficult. And then after learning them, it's kind of like doing math. You get used to it and you can learn new formulas a little easier, if that makes sense. Um, however, I think that these are amazing from a teacher's perspective. I uh, wish I had things like this, to be honest, when I was teaching my students how to speak French. You know, you, you point to the dictionary, there's like the sort of phonetic formulas and things like that, which are universal, but no one's really taught those things anymore. Your average person doesn't know them. This stuff is awesome. So go to praylatin.com. That is praylatin.com. You can see it right there. Make it big. Go to praylatin.com. Find these and they ship to... Canada, Mexico, US, over 35 US dollars. You can get packs of these cards. You can hand them out. It's an awesome thing. Thank you to the people at praylatin.com. Okay, so Pope Francis is heresy. <laughs> lucky, lucky us, we get to describe this. So basically what happened, if you weren't sure, is that um, I'll just pull up the article real quick here. It's about I'm almost a month old now at this point. Um, but this came out at LifeSite News. And... Um, here it is right here. Uh, bishops, priests, scholars correct Pope Francis statement on Holy Communion. So the, the meat of it is, is that we'll do a little control F search here. There's an idea in there that it says, and I'll make this bigger. This papal document, uh, Desiderio Desideravi, says that the garment of faith is all that is required to be admitted to the Eucharistic banquet. So basically this idea that as long as you have faith, whatever that is, you can go to the Holy Eucharist. This is a big problem, though, uh, because as the authors put out, the claim that faith, it's right here, the claim that faith is the only requirement for worthy reception of the Holy Eucharist was condemned by the Council of Trent. And this is what it says. Um, I'll just put the canon here rather than going through the explanation. If anyone says that faith alone is sufficient preparation, it's right here if you want to follow along and make this a little bit bigger as well. There we go. 
It says, if anyone says that faith alone is sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of most holy Eucharist, let him be anathema. Sequis, and we'll go to our Latin pronunciation there. Sequis dixedit solam fidem esse sufficientium, sufficientum preparationem et ad sumendum sanctissimum Eucharistiae sacramentum anathema, anathema sit. So if anyone says that faith alone is sufficient preparation for receiving the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, let him be anathema. <laughs> that's pretty, anyway, that's pretty good. Um, this claim also contradicts Canons 9, 15, 16, 7, 11, 7, 12, and so on and so forth. Canon 9, 15, those who have been excommunicated or interdicted after the imposition of a declaration of penalty can't go to Holy Communion. Okay, but here is what's not... And, I'm, and this is not me, this is not a slight to the authors of this. But guess what, folks? Pope Francis's heresy about Holy Communion is in canon law. And I'm going to show you. It's right here. So this is, um, this is from canon law, but it's got explanations. It's from Archbishop Lefebvre in the Vatican, which is a print book, but you can find it online easily from SSPX Asia. Okay, so... You know, it's interesting. So this canon 844, you can see that on the screen here. This one is actually a very useful canon for saying um, why you could actually miss mass if there was only Novus Ordo available, because it actually says right here, um, where does it say? Let me see, moral. There you go. Um, whenever necessity requires or a genuine spiritual advantage commends it, and provided the danger of indifferentism is avoided, Christ's faithful for whom it is physically or morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister may lawfully receive the sacraments of penance, the Eucharist, anointing of the sick from non-Catholic ministers. That would mean Orthodox. Uh, which is interesting. It says if it's morally impossible to approach a Catholic minister. That's not defined. It's completely subjective. To be honest, uh, that means anything from... Jimmy Martin is the only pr priest around and he's going to preach some rainbow heresy or Eucharistic sacrilege is happening all the time and you just morally can't take that. It's just something you can't do in good conscience. It's actually pretty easy. That's uh, you don't that's that's a a slam dunk of an argument as far as um a slam dunk of an argument as far as going to canon law to support the Society of St. Pius X's position that you don't always have to go if there's only a Novus Ordo around and there's nothing else, it's not a sin to miss mass because there is in canon law a moral impossibility. But here's the thing. There's much more to this canon, just like all canon law, there are subsections. And here's the subsection. This was actually one of the parts of Archbishop Lefebvre's major uh, decision to go through with the consecrations. And here's the explanation. This is why I recommend getting this book, Archbishop Lefebvre in the Vatican. For me, reading this book, I was completely convinced of everything after that because it was the actual canons and then the explanation by canon experts. Anyway, it says this canon is the most scandalous of the whole 1983 code. It is the open door to active communicatios in sacris, i.e. active religious participation with non-Catholics. And this is the what Pope Francis is saying is, is, is okay, is if you are non-Catholic but just have faith, I guess faith in the Eucharist, you can go to Holy Communion. No, you can't. Uh, Canon 1258 of the 1917 Code very strictly prohibited such particip participation. Um, Prummer, Father Prummer, he was a, an incredible moral theologian. Um, he gives us a simple reason. It is indeed nothing else than the negation of the Catholic faith and the acknowledgement of a heterodox worship. Participation in the sacraments in the mo is the most important part of the worship, especially for Holy Communion. Now Christ has founded and espoused only one church, and only the voice of the bride is agreeable to the bridegroom. Only the voice of the Son is agreeable to the Father. The active participation in non-Catholic worship is a practical denial of the nature of the church. The reverse is true as well. Having someone who's not Catholic actively participate in a Catholic worship in an active sense, not show up and observe, I hope anyone, I hope everyone goes to a, a good traditional Mass this weekend. I don't care if you're Muslim, Jew, whatever. Go and convert, and it's great, you know. But actively participating when you don't believe this is a grave sacrilege. So here's the money quote. It's subsection four. Okay. Now this is modernism 101. So it's shrouded in a lot of difficult to see things. And it says, if there is a danger of death or if the judgment of the diocesan bishop or of the Episcopal conference, uh, uh, there is some other grave and pressing need not to find and decision of the Episcopal conference. Well, how can an Episcopal conference decide what is the grave need for an individual to go to Holy Communion and whether or not they have the faith? This is impossible. 
says Catholic ministers may lawfully administer these same sacraments to other Christians not in full communion with the Catholic Church. By the way, if you're an anti-SSPX guy, <laughs> why are you so mad at the SSPX? Canada Law says non-Catholics can go because they're not if they're not in full communion. So I'm just being facetious here. But anyway, who cannot approach a minister of their own community and who spontaneously ask for them. See, this is the thing. They're saying an Episcopal conference or diocesan bishop, they can basically judge that someone can spontaneously ask for a sacrament, provided they demonstrate the Catholic faith and respect of these sacraments and are properly disposed. This is a big problem. This is, a, this is exactly, oh, I should have made that bigger. I'm sorry about that. This is exactly what Pope Francis is saying. As long as you have the garment of faith, you can go to the Holy Eucharist. No, no. You can have faith and not be in the church. And if you're not in the church, as canon law shows us in the canons that make sense and in history, you can't go to Holy Communion. You can't. You can also have the faith, you can also have faith in the Eucharist, but be publicly a heretic. And then if you go to Holy, and then going to Holy Communion, you condemn yourself. You drink, you eat your condemnation, as St. Paul says. We cannot, if you, know, if you know this, you cannot allow someone to go to Holy Communion. Faith in the Eucharist is not enough. Okay? This completely goes against the history of the church. And well, let's, let's read the commentary here for a second. The only sacraments, here's, here's a good explanation. The only sacraments which the church allows to be given by non-Catholic ministers are those which are absolutely required for salvation, so baptism and so forth, um, in danger of death and in the absence of a Catholic capable of baptizing, one should ask for this sacrament even from a non-Catholic. In danger of death, a Catholic who has fallen into mortal sin after his baptism in the absence of a Catholic priest should ask even a non-Catholic priest for the sacrament of penance. This would just be Orthodox priest, of course. For the sacraments not necessary for salvation, the church never allowed the faithful to go to a non-Catholic minister. This is going to the beginning of it. This is particularly required for the sacrament of Holy Eucharist, which is the sacrament of the unity of the church. That's why it's called in communion, out of communion, in, com in communion, excommunion. Okay? When someone goes to Holy Communion, when someone goes to Holy Communion, it's saying, I'm in the church. I'm communing with you. That's what that means. So somebody's not in the church and they don't believe what the church teaches, but happen to believe in the real presence of the Eucharist because some Protestants believe that, for example even though they don't have real sacraments, but maybe they believe it. The thing is, we don't even know what they believe about it. Because if someone's, I mean, how could you know if someone was a Protestant who's like an Anglican and says, I believe in the real presence of the Eucharist. But what they believe in, in Anglicanism is something like consubstantial or something like that. You know, Christ is present with the Eucharist, with the people there, and he comes alive when we receive as part of our faith. That's what they believe is the real presence. That's how they interpret it. So if someone remains an Anglican, he cannot approach the Holy Eucharist. He can convert. Sure. If he's dying and he says, I want to receive Holy Viaticum. This Catholic thing makes sense to me. I declare to you, Father, that I will join the Catholic Church. Please accept me and whatever. I don't know what the protocol is for that, but great. I mean, yes, you know, bring every soul into the church. And then at that point, I guess you can receive Viaticum and that's pretty simple. But this is not the same thing. It continues... The condition put here, provided that they demonstrate the Catholic faith and respect to these sacraments and are properly disposed, does not render this canon acceptable. Indeed, either one requires in them the real Catholic faith, therefore the repudiation of their errors and return to their unity of the church, and thus there is no more need of such a canon. See, that's the point. It's if you're going to come in to take the sacraments, you're a Catholic, so this is a, not a necessary canon. Or one requires only that they agree with the Catholic Church on the one particular point of faith in question. So this is the problem with this canon. This is astutely put. If someone believes in the faith, and the, you don't need that, this canon, this canon only causes confusion. This canon leads to Pope Francis's letter saying all you need is the faith. But no, you have to be in the church to commune with the sacraments in the church, unless they're salvific. And then at that point, you're, you're actually, in a sense, if you're being baptized because you're in danger of death, um, you're joining the church. So the, the point is you join the church with those sacraments. You don't join the church with Holy Communion. You express that you have joined the church by approaching it. 
That's the problem. See, this this heresy that's this this claim of heresy by these bishops that's found with Pope Francis's writings. Marcel Lefebvre was talking about this 35 years ago. This is the this is the or almost 40 years ago the new code. This is the heresy of Pope Francis in canon law. It's very simple. Pope Francis, in fairness, he's just writing a letter. He wrote a letter that expresses what's in the code. And this is why this will be justified in various dioceses. And you'll see this coming all over the place. It says, but this latter alternative is insufficient since the faith is not divisible. It is, it is one theological virtue. One cannot accept it at one point and reject it on another. Exactly. You can't have the faith piecemeal, knowingly. Knowing, of course, people can be confused, okay? But this is why this canon is impossible, okay? You can't be like a Lutheran and say, I believe in the real presence, but I also believe in Lutheranism. Or I believe in the real presence that is in Catholicism, but I also believe in Lutheranism. And because you believe in the real presence, you approach a Catholic minister. You can't do that. And that can't be allowed. And there's no canon that could ever justify that because it's the virtue of faith. So if Pope Francis says, as long as they have the garment of faith, they're saying the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, the virtue of faith contains all the sub virtues. So you can't just divide them out and say, I don't have any of these. And I have some of those. Therefore I have faith. You don't faith. This is modernism. This is this. If read Pashendi by Pope Pius X, this is straight modernism this idea that faith is something that bubbles up from in, in uh, within you and it grows and it sort of blossoms this is gnosticism this is a this is a bottom up approach whereas faith is actually a, a real thing that we assent to and exists exterior from us this is why we can say keep the faith not keep your faith or not uh find your faith inside of you maybe that's something that a modernist would say but the faith is the faith of the church and we assent to it and we believe it as best as we possibly can. We could accidentally be wrong. Of course, I mean, we're all wrong on things. But if we are knowingly in a heretical sect or outside the church intentionally, we can't then say have faith sufficient to approach Holy Communion within the church because Holy Communion is the sign of unity of the church. And that person is either in rejection of it uh, doctrinally or in rejection of it from perspective of, of jurisdiction. Pope Francis's heresy is found in canon law. And it has been for a long time. This is one of the reasons why Marcel Lefebvre did the consecration. Because he realized the law itself now, the positive law of the church, is condemning itself. So you can't... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's illegitimate. You know, uh, I'll give you an example. It's like these um, laws in Canada the last few years, couple years almost three, with all the lockdown stuff about the things you don't mention on YouTube. But the court cases, one of the arguments that they're making against these restrictions is that the actual courts are illegitimate in hearing these cases because the courts accepted all of the measures from the experts and applied them. So how can we trust that they would be unbiased in hearing a case that says they're wrong when they're implying them, literally applying them while the case is happening? You know, a court... Uh, hearing a case against lockdown restrictions is literally in lockdown and doing things on Zoom, what's the likelihood that they're going to say, yeah, lockdown's illegal when they're when they're enforcing it while they're talking to you, while you're trying to argue it's illegal? It's, it's an illegitimate court. It condemns itself. The positive law of the country condemns the actual legal structure of the country in that instance. And the same thing in canon law here, this code is nonsensical. It's basically saying, if you're not a Catholic... You can go to Holy Communion as long as you believe in Holy Communion. But the history of the church and other canons, in fairness, in this canon, a code of canon law, say the opposite. So the canon is irrelevant. It's an illegitimate canon. But it's promulgated as if it is valid and binding. And it's used, I would imagine, I'm, Pope Francis is probably smarter than me, definitely has smarter advisors. I would imagine that the modernists, the worm tongues around him, are advising him that your letter, Desiderio Desideravi, could be buttressed by canon law, and therefore, in our current legal structure, positive law, not divine law, can be applied in the diocese, and there can be no legal reproach. So you send in your dubias, you send in your appeals, you send in your whatever the documents are called when you get things from hierarchs in Rome. Guess what? They come back and they say, 
He's only expressing in a pastoral manner with the new springtime and the surprises of the Holy Spirit, what is already in canon law, which is binding on every Catholic. And then they'll cite some canon and say, you know, we must remain in the church and blah, blah, blah. And St. Paul says whatever, you know, that's how this works. Marcel Lefebvre knew this, and this is why one of the reasons he protested. How can you trust the legal structures of the church to juridically run things properly when the co code itself contains, contains something that is condemned by the code itself? Okay, I've said enough. Okay, so that's my rant. Like this video. I never said that. Please like this video. Please subscribe to this channel. Visit the links in the description. Support PrayLatin.com. And uh, that's it. This has been the Kennedy Report. And until next time, God bless.